that's gonna bug that's gonna bug me it's gonna bug me a lot it was an at least it looked l shaped from the parking lot and i want to say there was water near it too but it wasn't it was i don't know i'd say it was probably like less than a 30 minute drive to the track i don't know Primo's dad was driving. Oh, well, that's, that's sick. Rocket Lab was... Rocket Lab's happening right now. I'll, I'll switch to coverage here, but that's going to bug me for the rest of the day. I'll keep it up in the background here. Uh, here, let me... Just give it up already. Check receipts, bank statements. Nah, that's not fun. I want to scavenger hunt it, man. It's more fun that way. Honestly, uh, I'd rather spend the time doing this than digging through receipts, dude. Oh, Rocket Lab, please rescue us from the scrub timber nightmare it was a dream uh, i'll tell you what py at times route 154 definitely does seem like a dream dude some of the stuff that we did was just kind of nuts i don't think it was a residence inn i want to say it was a marriott dude Once again, I have the launch up in the background. Seem like getting engaged. Dude, yeah, I can't believe I did that. That's pretty that's pretty freaking cool. How long ago did you do Rat 154? Hey Rec. Uh it was October uh September late September into October 2021, so it was basically about a year ago. And Primo, I won't give it up. No. No. Must find it. I'll know it when I see it, dudes. We didn't go that far out. That was not, that's too far out. Yeah, solar a year. Route 154 was about a year ago, guys. Yeah, he left. We flew out of Boston the end of September. I don't remember exactly when. Try this one. Okay. Where's Waldo's hotel? No, it was not that close. It wasn't that close, dude. No, I got we got off the highway here and drove down here. Nah, it wasn't any of this. It looked Hillness, it looked like it was in a former industrial area. Like it was very much kind of like this, but not as incoherent. It looked Discovery, go at like this. See what I'm talking about? It looked like that. Hold on, what's that? No, no, that's not it. Hey, rare is 57 months. That Route 154 was in August. No, I announced it in August. It was late September to the beginning of October. It was exactly a year ago. I remember getting off the highway and going under the bridge to a gas station on one side, and then we had to go back this way to the hotel or something along those lines. All right, anyway, let's watch a rocket. I'll figure that out later. Rockets, baby. Bit it was around Riley.
Hello from Rocket Lab's Mission Control Centre. We're live with a view of Electron on the pad at Launch Complex 1 in Mahia, New Zealand for our 30th Electron mission, a dedicated launch for Japanese Earth imaging com customer, Synspective. My name is Felicity Powell, and I'm so glad you could join us for this hey, landmark mission today. Hey, where's Muriel? T0 is currently set for 0838 local Where's time, Muriel? and as this will be an instantaneous launch window, we have just one chance to fly per day. However, if we do need to stand down what for any reason, us? we have plenty of opportunities over the next 13 oh days God. as a backup. Nope. If Suspective sounds like a familiar name, it's because they're a return customer to Rocket Lab, with today's mission being Suspective's third mission on Electron. We first launched for Synspective at the end of 2020 with The Owl's Night Begins, our 17th mission, a dedicated electron launch of Synspective's cutting-edge Earth observation satellite, Strix Alpha. And then earlier this year, we launched them again, this time part of a three-launch series of Synspective's Strix satellites with The Owl's Night Continues. The 24th Electron mission was also the first launch from Pad B at Launch Complex 1, which we'll be launching from again this morning. Discovery. Operating no two pads up. at Launch Complex 1 doubles our launch capacity and Pray eliminates married, pad recycle sub. time, since we can switch between pads, enabling back-to-back -back missions like our recent missions for the NRO. Today's mission is called The Owl Spreads Its Wings, and it's carrying Strix-1, Suspector's first commercial SAR satellite. The Owl is a symbol of wisdom and luck in many cultures, including Japan. Owls also have binocular eyes, much like we do, which gives them excellent visual acuity to judge height and distances. They have extraordinary night vision and the ability to see small details from far away. Tell the facts. 16 months. Barn owls of the Strix genus can also use their asymmetric ears to hunt using sound. In a similar way, the synthetic aperture radar technology on Synspective satellites, known by the acronym SAR, uses the echo of radio waves to create two- and three-dimensional images with millimeter-level resolution yes, of the Earth's synthetic surface. synthetic aperture. Very because cool. Because the technology does not rely on visual el electromagnetic wavelengths, it can produce I don't know, these high-resolution images regardless of cloud cover or daylight. That day was a blur. This resilience makes the strict satellites ideal for complex tasks such as disaster response in all conditions, monitoring flooding and inclement weather systems, urban development and planning, and construction and infrastructure monitoring. Let's learn more about Synspective. Yes, let's. No, that's not it. We'll find this. I will find you. 465, the meridian or I-69. Discovery, go at throttle up. Go to that throttle up. Hey, Phil. Junie, take, take it down a notch, my brother. Illness is good people. That's really cool, that's, yeah. Residence Inn by Marriott, India, Indianapolis. You got it, Bree? Yeah, Patton. I haven't played it in a little while, though. That's it. Yeah, you got it, Bree. Looked it up, though. Where, are, where the hell are we? Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I found it, dude. I found it. I found it. I found it. I found it. Bree found it. 
Rebound it. We're gonna do it. I'll show you. So it's over here. We went up and then we went this way. never gonna find it, dudes. We were never gonna find that because it's new construction next to a body of water. Hey, L-shaped building next to water, dude. That's all I remembered, man. It was near the highway and there was a gas station on the other side of the Dude, I don't even remember, I don't even remember there being a roundabout there. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember any of that. I didn't even, dude, I didn't even notice there was a diverging diamond there. Oh, you were like a mile away from you. Yeah, that's where we were, Solar Lander. Yeah. During Route 154, we met up with Bree's parents there. Yeah, and they, we two car convoyed it back because we were worried. I wasn't entirely sure why the wheel came off. So we convoyed with them to make sure that that didn't happen. Today's mission isn't the last time we'll see the OWL taking flight from Launch Complex 1, with another Suspective mission already booked for next year. Now we're coming up on the T-minus 12-minute poll when our operators will run through the go-no-go no -go calls with the Launch Director. With Let's listen in to Mission Control radar. to wait for yes. the call. I don't think there's going to be a recovery this mission field, but she may have said that while I was trying to figure out where the thing was. How close to Auckland is that? Uh, it's a fair bit north. In all stations, proceeding with the go no go sequence. Fair bit Stage. northeast. Stages go. Avionics. Avionics is go. GNC. GNC is go. Econ. Discovery. No Econ go. Flight control T1. or land center. T1 is go. I'll let you decide. GC. GC is Reeds, go. keep on keeping on. PLS. First switch baby, PLS by the way. Go. Thanks, man. RSO. RSO is go. Met. Met is go. MM. MM is go. Yeah, let's... Mm -hmm. LD sup. LD sup is go. I think she meant payload hibbit, but yeah. We'll see. Okay, that is the go, no go sequence complete. We are T minus 11 minutes and 16 seconds and counting. Okay, gone around the horn and flight That's control confirmation there. from Mission Control. All systems are healthy and we're proceeding the with the today, remainder huh? of the count. T0 is still targeted for 0838 no New Zealand local time. Yep. It's currently 827 local time and we are 10 minutes away from liftoff from yeah, Launch Complex 1. Now, Launch Complex 1 was the world's first and is still the only private orbital launch complex. Established in 2016, we have now launched 29 times from this location, soon to be 30 with today's mission. We also have our second orbital launch complex on Wallops Island in Virginia, yeah. which is slated Wallops. to launch its first electron flight in December this year. New Zealand Sun we're, exciting to be, we're excited to be debuting Launch Complex 2 and can't wait to share more about our plans at Wallops, with our new neutron production facility and launch pad being established okay. on the island we as well. Here's our VP of Launch, Sean DeMello, with more on LC1. Launch Complex 1 is like no other launch site in the world. Uh, we literally started on a green field here in Mahia Peninsula, built one little pad and a small integration facility, and now we have two pads, a number of clean rooms, making a world-class launch facility. Hey, Reaper. Ah, oh, that's so cool.
We created a launch complex that was capable of launching once every 72 hours to a range of inclinations, right from mid-inclination, about 30 degrees, all the way to sun-synchronous orbit, all from Launch Complex 1. This guy has so with a, Pad B, we took a lot of the design like from our original Indian, Pad A and made some small improvements to make our operation that much accent. more efficient. We use the same integration facility, the same rocket nice runway, um, with our final infrastructure all placed in a concrete pad no more bigger than a tennis court. With two launch pads, we have doubled our capacity and reached ultimate launch flexibility. This means when a customer needs us, we've got a pad ready. From LC1, we've flown yeah, over 100 satellites to date, all supporting everything from climate science through to international logistics, maritime surveillance, to the moon and beyond. Yeah, they have the capstone mission. It's on its way out to the moon. They, they use these for this launch site for polar launches, Alice. Because if you figure the launch site, if it's, it's really far it's south or really far north, high powerful flight, you're literally not spinning as fast than you are at stage the equator. LD mission. So it's actually LD easier stage. to get into polar orbits from launch sites that are closer to objects. the poles. Proceeding with sequence 57. Figure. Mm -hmm. Ilna. Ilya. No. No, no, no. Uh, this is fully expendable. Yeah, it looks a little breezy. If they do launch, you'll see Electron kind of wiggling as it goes all the way up if it's windy. It can go into the wind. It's no problem. Also, interesting to look at that fairing that has those blisters GC, on the sides. LD mission. LDGC. And proceed with sequence 58. Launch pad ready. Roger. Okay. Proceeding with launch pad ready. Stage 1 and stage 2 high voltage batteries ready for flight. Yeah, rocket guides. Yeah, you could see the wind kind of pushing the thing around on the way up. All engine blips are nominal. All yeah, are like Matt Black. Yeah, the reason why the rocket is dark colors is because the electron is made out of carbon fiber. Stage it's carbon fiber stages. Stage terminal checks are complete. The Can't reason why it's called electron is because the the motors, the Rutherford engines. There's nine of them in the first stage. Those engines are have electronic fuel injection. Yeah. That's the right way to say that. It has EFI. They have an electric motor that's spinning an impeller to feed propellants into the rocket engine. It's the only rocket engine around that does that. Uh, every other rocket engine uses like a jet engine or a ga like a gas generator or stage combustion or uh, heating the propellants launch, up. As we prepare for launch, we're checking off a few more to, uh, achievements for the year. 2022 has already been packed full of Electron has an electric Our fuel first pump. launch from Pad it's B in fuel February. Injection. Our first helicopter catch recovery mission there and back again in April. Yep. And the success of the capstone mission to the moon for NASA, the first step in the Artemis program in yeah, July. Mm -hmm. Today's mission is also a landmark for our Electron program, including the 300th okay, Rutherford engine we've flown to space and the 150th satellite delivered to orbit. Yeah, yeah I know, Tom. Yeah, I was going to say it's the only one flying because Delphin don't fly no more. There's batteries, yeah, Jordis. Now you guys think it's like, oh my gosh, it's got to move all those batteries. No, Recently, it doesn't. we also conducted. It doesn't need to. The batteries don't need to be that big. The batteries only need to last eight minutes. That's all it takes for to get. That's all. It, that's all it needs to get up into orbit. So you actually don't need as many batteries as you might think, right? Like it's not an electric car. You're not trying to get 300 mile range with this thing. The batteries only need to be going, and they do, they only need to discharge a very high amount of energy. There's, speaking of one, there's one going right there. They only need to discharge a high amount of electricity, right? For eight minutes at best. That's all. Oh, that's freaking cool, man. Look at the, look at the thing gimbal. So stay tuned for more details on that mission. We can't wait to share. Oh, that's, that's very good. Speaking of milestone achievements, earlier this year, Rocket Lab held a groundbreaking a ceremony motor. for our new cool. neutron production complex. It's a Carolox rocket. Which, as mentioned before, will be in RP1. Wallops Island, Virginia. Neutron is Rocket Suckers Lab's electrical. next generation launch vehicle in development, designed to lift eight tons of payload and to provide a tailored launch solution for satellite mega constellations. Yeah. As Electron a reusable is not rocket, very big. Neutron not a very is designed to land back on the launch pad just, after a mission, and from like there the, it would, would, the would be returned to the production complex like for refurbishment person's? and reflight. While today's mission will lift off from Launch Complex 1, we'll Falcon soon be seeing a different view as we prepare space. for our first mission from LC2 in Virginia. That mission, for our friends at Hawkeye 360, is currently scheduled for launch in December.
and we cannot wait to see Electron headed to space through Virginia skies. With that mission, we'll be launching Electron from a total of three pads, supporting a rapid launch cadence and offering New our Zealand. customers flexibility over their launch location and orbits. Nice Jack's shirt. Arigato gozaimasu. We are now moving towards the final stages of liftoff with T minus four minutes remaining on the clock. At T minus two minutes, Electron moves into terminal count and the rocket's flight computers take over the countdown. Shortly after the two minute after mark, launch, we right? should hear the call that liquid oxygen loading is complete, which means that the vehicle is fully fueled and good to go. <laughs> the next yeah, gate after that is the signal that the first and second stages are pressurized for launch. And finally, we await the 10 second oh, countdown yeah. to liftoff with our launch director, Joseph Carpico. Let's listen in to Mission Control for these final steps ahead of liftoff. It's a light, it, no, it's not medium duty, right? Neutron, their next rocket is medium duty. This is a light duty rocket, it's a small sat launcher. About, it can do about like 1,100 pounds, the sun synchronous, so that's like a 350 mile orbit, 350 by 350, about 1,100 pounds. It's small, small rocket. Um, like, we're talking like redstone small. It's about the size of a redstone rocket, actually. It's actually very... Venture class, yeah, that's what it's called, rocket guy, yeah. Because they didn't want to call it small, small rocket. Small. It's LD to all stations on mission. From now on, there should be no red flags on your critical LCCs. VCON, LD mission. LD so, VCON. Confirm all expected flight computer ASGOs are green. Confirm, as goes are green. Okay, everything is good. Uh, guys, I'm just going to say this. I'm cranking the volume. Electron is known, and Rocket Lab is known for having really good audio at liftoff. Um, so it might get loud in the next couple of minutes. Go for launch. I'm turning yeah, the audio go on. For launch. You've been warned. Not this one, Rain, not this one. They will do that in the future, though. How though? The stage is made out of carbon fiber. It's extremely light, so you can use parachutes to have it basically, the, basically the first stage has a parafoil and it just kind of sails around and then a helicopter will go and snag the parachute and tow it power. back. All ground power disabled. Vehicle is fully on internal power. Okay, they cut they cut the connection from the grid. The batteries it's, that are on board are powering and enabled for flight. Okay. Termination system is armed. They almost did it once, Rain. Almost. Locks look complete. Lock system in recirculation. Okay, vehicles topped off. They'll go into replenish mode here. Meaning that they're just gonna... The, the, the liquid oxygen, the white parts of the rocket, that's just ice on the side of the vehicle. It's Well, it's condensation because the thing is so cold, it's freezing the humidity in the atmosphere. All helium anti-geysering disabled. Okay, so what they're gonna do is, because it's being stored at very high pressure and it's liquid oxygen is extremely cold, it likes to boil, it likes to boil off. That's why they're in replenish mode. That's what the, uh, see that white line right there, the, the, the white connection? The locks line. Stage one and, and then stage the locks line for the first course. stage is down at the bottom. It's in a tail service mask. Those are High flow engine purge enabled. Okay, they are purging purging out the engines there. The sheep are go. T minus thirty seconds. Wake Water up. deluge is sheep. activated. Okay. Pad deluge and sound suppressor is on. They do that to make sure that the the sound from the vehicle doesn't reverberate T off the ground and damage the rocket on the way up. Rockets are so loud that sound can damage things. Okay. Ten seconds. Here we go. Ten, Let's fly. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, she's flying. Very good. Okay, Al spreads its wings. It's spreading its wings. 
Everything looked good there. Separation from the pad looked... Ooh. Hold on. Yeah. Something's streaking off the side of the vehicle. It probably is, it could just be ice. Stage one propulsion. Our 30th Electron has taken to the skies, having Again. successfully lifted off the pad at Launch Complex 1. Again. You can see the distinctive yeah, shape of the Mahia Peninsula below. As the vehicle is on its way to space, carrying our 300th Rutherford engine and 150th satellite. Yeah, now the next watch. critical stage in Electron's the flight is Max Q, like maximum this. aerodynamic this pressure. This is when the vehicle's velocity and local so air density are at their maximum and the bit. vehicle experiences the most mechanical Wind. stress. We'll hear that call from Mission Control when Electron clears that stage of flight. They don't launch as Q much as SpaceX Q. rain, but yeah, they, they launch a lot. Probably has been around for a good while. Yeah. Electron has successfully passed through Max Q and at an altitude yeah, the, of just the over 15 kilometers is now. well look on its it. way to pass the Kármán line and enter orbit. The nine cool? sea-level Rutherford engines happen. on the it's first stage are operating nominally and we are approaching the next series of events in the mission. The first step after Max Q is MECO, or main engine cutoff, when those first nine engines throttle down before shutting off completely. This slows the vehicle marginally before the first stage separates from the vehicle. Once this is complete, the second stage space optimized Rutherford engine ignites to take the payload and kick stage the rest of the way into orbit. These three events happen in quick succession, so keep an eye out and listen in for the call from Mission Control. Okay, as the rocket gets up higher, the ambient Rotate pressure goes down, seconds. so the gases expand. And because of the nine engine configuration, you get a really cool flow oh, phenomenon coming off there. Yeah, if you see. A little bit of sparks coming cool. from coming from the rocket engines. That's normal. That's used, that's really normal with kerosene. Uh, with a kerosene engine, they do they do stuff like that because they, well, carbon emissions. To be honest with you, that's easier way of saying that. You're confirmed. They, stage separation successful. Okay. Off the stage ignition. Stage ignition looks really good. Camera's not completely in sync, but it looks right. Yeah, it's basically but getting done, done, and done. So With that, we've confirmed Miko totally stage normal. separation and ignition of the space optimized Rutherford Ooh. engine on the second stage. Ooh. At this point, as Electron has cleared most Ooh. of Earth's atmosphere, it can also jettison the payload fairing, as it is no longer needed to protect the payload. Now, see that silver thing up on the top right? The, the silver box that's behind the trajectory and the thing that says stage two? That's a battery. The second stage needs to... Oh, there goes the payload fairing. The second stage needs to burn a little... You can see it there on your screens. Electron's fairing has now <laughs> been ejected with the two pieces yeah, falling away. From, Electron's second right stage there. is continuing nominally on its way to orbit, carrying its inspective payload, which is now exposed in preparation of deployment. The vehicle is currently reaching speeds yeah, of more than 8,000 kilometers far. per hour and at an altitude of 131 kilometers. So... The second stage has to burn a little bit longer than the first stage. It's about a six minute burn. So what they do, they don't stage the rocket with the second stage, they stage the batteries. Batteries are heavy, even the if they don't have charge The continuing nominally on They're its flight to low Earth orbit, currently traveling one. at a speed of over 9,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 140 kilometers. As Electron lifted off the pad, you would have seen big clouds of what looks like smoke billowing out from under the vehicle. That's actually steam, produced as the exhaust of the engines makes contact with the water deluge. No, no attempt. We this use time water to absorb the immense sound energy produced by those nine Rutherford engines at liftoff. It's a little missile top left, this thing. I mean, seriously, it's it's like an IRBM from back in the day with an upper stage on top of it. Think like a redstone rocket with an upper stage. It's about the same size. Does this make Electron a 2.5 stage rocket then? I mean, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, stage two telemetry is cool. That line should get flatter over time. We're now almost five minutes into the mission for the owl spreads its wings, our electron flight for Sinspective. The vehicle with payload is traveling at a speed of over 11,000 kilometers per hour, currently at an altitude of no. 176 kilometers, Pascal, well on totally its way company. to low Earth orbit. The low Earth orbit zone, often noted as LEO, is classified by having an apogee of less than 2,000 kilometers, or approximately 1,200 miles. Propulsion holding nominal. Yeah, pretty much, Jim. Yeah, you could, Nighthound, but they, they, they won't. They won't do. 
Their new, their new rocket, Neutron, is... Yeah, you're in for a treat with that rocket. I wish they'd showed more, but then again, I, they may have, and I just wasn't listening. So. Next up is a step we refer to as the battery hot swap. Yeah, the Rutherford is a unique engine in that it is powered battery. by electric pumps, which draw energy like from batteries. Once those batteries are depleted, they're just dead weight, so we shed them to swap out for a fresh one. If you watch carefully, you'll see that shiny silver battery separate from electrons soon. Yeah, watch. That's the battery, and when the battery the CPU goes... battery discharge holding nominal, reaching hot swap in roughly 30 seconds. When the battery goes dead, down. they'll switch to another battery, and they'll dump that one. It, it'll burn up in the atmosphere, guys. You don't have to worry about it polluting anything. I got you, Diddly. I, I knew someone was going to ask. I got you. There it goes. Bye-bye. You might have seen it there. Battery hot swap has been successfully completed, and a new battery is powering the second stage onto orbit. You're about two thirds of the way there. Are you serious, Tara? I just told you that a moment ago. Our 30th electron vehicle, electron vehicle is in the air and on its way to space, continuing our mission to make space accessible for all. We're also on a mission to make the space industry accessible to all, with more opportunities and pathways into careers with Rocket Lab than ever before. It's never too late to reconsider an old dream or a new aspiration and reach for the stars with us. Check out the careers page on our website, or if you're not quite ready for recruitment, our education programs will help get you there. Go to rocketlabusa.com to find out more. Better just chat. Holding nominal. Electron is currently at an altitude of 206 kilometers, traveling at a speed of over 19,000 kilometers per hour on its way to space. While this particular mission is not a recovery mission, our recovery program is progressing at speed with the first test of a recovered Rutherford engine just two weeks ago, and it was a roaring success. We're looking forward to the next 30 minute missions and beyond, perhaps even flying fully reusable hardware to improve sustainability and value for our customers. Yeah, that and it's really freaking cool. I mean, that's that's pretty neat. The next major milestone we're approaching is second engine cutoff, or SECO. Just like Miko, our space-optimized Rutherford engine on the second stage will throttle down ahead of separation from the kick stage, which takes the payload to exactly where it needs to go. Might be the encoder, but it looks like they're getting some slight resonant vibrations on the nozzle. Guidance is in so total, 27 very seconds remaining. Nozzle, it's kind of doing this. That's, I mean, it's probably has done that before. Either that or it's just the encoder. Yeah, you generally don't want a resonant frequency in your nozzle like that. Uh, you don't need the nozzle to do this. It's not supposed to. It's not supposed to flicker, but obviously it's working just fine. So, but once again, it could just be the encoder trying to interpolate the flashes there. That this is being live streamed to us. So it's Seco kinda, confirmed. Yep, Seco. There's the gas. Well, it yep, it looked like it was working just fine. Yeah, see one one moment. It was the same thing, Vulcan. The nozzle was. You may have heard the call there. The vacuum optimized Rutherford yeah. engine has throttled down, and the kick stage has cleanly separated from the second stage. From here, the small but mighty Curie yeah, engine yeah. will take the payload it's to its stuff. exact destination in space. For the next 50 minutes or so, the kick stage will enter a coast phase until it reaches the apogee of its elliptical orbit, the furthest distance away from Earth. From here, no, the Curie engine kicks in to adjust its perigee to a circular orbit at this point. Once it reaches the orbit our customer has requested, we'll deploy Inspective's Strix-1 satellite to its new home in space. Yeah, looks good. We won't have a live video feed from the kick stage on this mission, but we will stay with you on this webcast to bring you a simulated view of payload deployment.
We'll take a bit of a break on the webcast now, but we'll be back with you closer to payload deployment to listen in on those final moments from Mission Control. This last step in the mission is expected to take place at T plus 53 minutes, and we'll see you back here then. Yeah, yeah see they launched south, or, well, southwest out of Latvia. That'll get you into a nice polar orbit. So, Timmy's music. So, I know that looks like not exactly a polar orbit, right? Like, you'd think that a polar orbit would be a straight line that's going up and down here, right? Well, one, the Earth is spinning underneath the spacecraft, so it's always going to end up looking like a sine wave. Two, you got to launch a little bit southeast. Anybody know why? With a polar orbit? Why you would want to launch southeast? If you're trying to go have an orbit that goes directly north-south, right? And this one is, well, this one is sun-synchronous, so it's slightly retrograde. Why would you launch southeast? I can see my house from here. Precession. Well, the sun synchronous orbit uses precession, right? The sun synchronous orbit is designed to use Earth's precession to image the same spot every day. But they need to launch a little bit southeast out of the gates here, so to speak, to negate the spinning. To negate that spinning. Because if you launch just if you launched in the direction that you want to go, right? By the time the rocket gets up into space, that ain't going to be the right direction anymore because Earth spun underneath you. So you, rockets, if you're going into a sun synchronous or a polar orbit, compensate for that by doing a dog leg right, like that. See, right there, that straight part of the orbit is it turning right. Now, now you see how the orbit is kind of curving. That's after engine cutoff. This is under prop. It was basically it's basically a straight line. See how that starts to curve after that behind my head? Pretty cool, huh? You're negating you're negating the, the spinning rotation of the Earth. It's interesting because if they want to get into a 97 degree orbit, you want to get into a sun synchronous orbit from Vandenberg up here in California, they got they gotta launch it this way. They gotta launch way over here to negate the spinning because they're closer to the equator. The equator is right here. That's why, see how the line is super straight here? That's compensated. That's basically negating out any rotation force that was imparted on the vehicle from when it launched. And now that it's coasting, it's just... This orbit will basically go up here, and then it'll go that way. And then... It'll basically go down like that again. Doesn't The polar orbit doesn't look, look right when it's stretched over a 2D view like this, but... A polar orbit, guys, or an orbit with an inclination above, uh, like, 80 degrees. So, uh, let, let me describe inclination. So, inclination, if you draw a line right here, that's Earth's equator, right? Earth's equator is basically in the center of this map, more or less, right? When the orbit crosses the equator, whatever the angle is of the orbit relative to the equator is the, how much the orbit is inclined. Inclination always works off of a celestial body's equator, or the theoretical equator of a celestial body. Keep in mind, Earth is not a perfectly uniform sphere, so the equator kind of... It's not perfect. It's not a perfectly straight line. Uh, but whatever the angle is relative to the orbit when it passes the equator, right, that's your inclination. If you're following the equator, right, so your orbital inclination is zero and your orbit is basically on the equator, that's called a equatorial orbit. I know, I know, I know, I know. Crazy, right? If you're in a polar orbit, so if following the equator is zero, what's a polar orbit? What's going directly north-south? 90, 90 degrees, right? So a polar orbit would have a 90 degree inclination. And then once you get past 90 on your inclination, then stuff starts getting a little funky. Now you're now you're going against the Earth's rotation. Anywhere from zero to 90, right, in terms of inclination, is a prograde orbit, meaning you're going with the direction that the Earth spins. This type of orbit that this satellite is going into, this blue sky satellite, is a retrograde orbit. It's almost polar, but it's slightly on the retrograde side. That slight retrograde inclination, so it's at 97 degrees. 
slight retrograde inclination basically allows the satellite to comp to use Earth's precession to compensate, so it comp like to change its orbit to perturb the orbit every day, uh, and um, that basically makes it so the satellite flies over the same spot every day. Now, I don't think I need to tell you guys what the application is there. Why would you want a satellite to go over the same spot every day? Think about it for a second. How big is this satellite? It couldn't be any bigger than an engine block. Mind control. No, no. Mind control with geostationary would be much better for that charity. If you said if you said spy satellites, yeah, exactly. Earth observation satellites are in sun synchronous orbits. They're designed to image the same spot every day. Some satellites can change their orbits too. But the precession will basically make it so the satellite when it's coming up over the horizon will be going over the same spot every day so you can take a picture of the same spot every day. So you can peep on what your enemy's doing at their air base or their or their or their spaceport right that's why they do these sun synchronous orbits they're slightly past polar they're 97 degrees inclined so that's a retrograde orbit retrograde goes against the way the earth spins and the satellite going against the grain coupled with the fact that earth isn't an isn't a uniform sphere basically has the orbit kind of move with Earth's wobble to go over the same spot every day. It's really, really complicated mathematics. And somebody somebody figured that out in the 60s and it was <laughs> that's that's pretty that's pretty neat. That's pretty that's pretty cool. Isn't the X37B just an upgradable spy sat? Pretty much. But uh SWK, I, I don't know nothing about X37. What's an X37B? I don't know what that is. What it does, I have no idea. No, I don't know. I don't know what it is. How could I? How could I know? How could I know? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it does. I don't know what you're talking about. So see, look, the the orbit would appear to curve. Right? The, the orbit isn't curved. The satellite's still going in the same direction. The thing is that Earth's gravity is pulling it around, right? And the Earth is spinning underneath that. So, you get a... And notice, it's retrograde. Satellite's going... It's going east to west on your screen. If this was a prograde orbit, it'd be going that way. It would be going west to east. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, yeah, of course, Scully. Yeah. East? I thought you said weast. Yeah, so that's why the Ma that's why they launched from the Mahia Peninsula. It's a really good it's a really good launch site for um, for getting satellites into small satellites into a sun synchronous. And once again, the, the closer, if you're trying to get into a, a sun synchronous or a polar style orbit, right? That'll be a polar, near polar orbit, positive or positive or retrograde, right? Uh, going, launching from a spot that's either more north or more south is better because the Earth is technically spinning slower up there. Once again, non-uniform sphere. The Earth is like a giant spinning jello mold. I hate jello. Oh, come on, man. There's always room for jello. You jello, bro? I mean, maybe a little bit. Does this launch have a photon third stage on it? I'm not sure, Squishchin. Jello is deeply underrated. I'm more of a pudding guy. 
What are the red circles on the map? Just got here. Oh, it's a good question. They're, they're ground, tra ground tracking stations, Steve. And once again, notice, fellas, that some of the shapes of the ground tracking stations aren't a perfect circle. Once again, non-uniform sphere. They're not perfect. The, the other part of that is that this is a... This is a 2D image of a 3D object, so you're gonna, the, the closer that they are to the north and the south, the more oblong they're going to look, gonna, the more they're gonna look like an egg. But also, that happens, it, Earth's non-uniform non sphere, it's not exactly spherical, so they will have a, even if we were looking at this in 3D, it still wouldn't be a perfect circle. Like, does the payload need to be boosted again after initial orbital insertion, or is it just separate from the second stage? Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's question. Once again, I, do, I don't know. I know what a photon stage is. I, I don't, I, I'm telling you, I don't know. I, I wasn't, I was explaining something when she was explaining the mission. <laughs> Sorry, man. Look at the top pole track. Yeah, yeah. There's a polar tracking station up there. Drummer, I see it. It looks like they have one... It looks like they have a tracking station on the Galapagos Islands, huh? And what, what's that one? Maldives? There's one in Perth. There's a kickstage to circularize the orbit at Apogee. Yeah, so it, it's got the photon upper stage on it before. Thank you. There's a photon on every electron launch. The payload always needs a burn on top of it to go to the final orbit. Thank you. Today I learn. See that, guys? That's just wide Greenland, okay? Wide. Yeah, they got, I know that one's Perth, and then they got a bunch in New Zealand because that's where it launched from. There's one over here, and it looks like there's one in Madrid, too. And then there's another one in, in Greece. Yeah, interesting. How is Astra doing? Astra scrapped Rocket 3.3. They retired that design, and they're working on a new bigger rocket that's derived from that's using Firefly-derived propulsion, Thorin. They, uh... Yeah. Yeah, Rocket, yeah, they're, they're doing things. Yeah, things. <clears throat> Guys, I'll be right back one second. I'm just gonna grab something and drink. No, EJ, you cannot have the drink. Can I have gloves and steering wheel? Gloves, steering wheel. I've never noticed that the Antarctic Peninsula that connects to South America in that weird way before. Tectonic plates, man. Yeah, once again, the image is getting squashed and stretched because oblate spheroid superimposed onto a 2D plane doesn't really look right. Question, for a satellite to return to the same spot every day, do sun-synchronous orbits have to be circular or are they elliptical with an extremely high apogee? They're usually circular, Devious, yeah.
this thing's gonna skirt the uh, South Atlantic anomaly, interestingly enough. Uh, no, Paul, uh, this is a, um, uh, this is a, uh, it, it's a private company, Blue Sky. So it's a synthetic aperture radar uh, that is, um, it's privately owned. It's not a spy satellite. This is used for, I mean, synthetic aperture radars are used for all kinds of things, dude. It's used for all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Mab, there's tectonic plates, dude. Uh, so, Earth, like I said, you know what I said a second ago and how I always say Earth's a big jello mold? Uh, believe it or not, the, the seven continents on Earth were actually one continent. A lot of people know that, right? It was Pangaea, right? But what a lot of people don't know is that that's happened three times. It's happened three times. They spread out, and then everything moves back, and they become a supercontinent again, and then it spreads out, and then it comes back, and then it spreads out and comes back. It's done it three times in Earth's history. Commercial spy satellites are very much a thing. Yeah, Edmund, I know, but do me a favor and take a hint here. Do you think they would tell people, they would showcase their capability if it was a commercial, sky, uh, commercial spy satellite? Do you think they would have a whole little infographic on how the satellite works? Come on, man. Come on, use that noodle. Use the noodle, my dude. I don't think they would brag about it to everybody if they were, you know, showing how good their spy satellite is, dude. <laughs> ABL, all pre-launch operations are complete. We are working with the FAA to finalize their launch window. Cool. You broke my noodles? Breaking noodles is fine. It's the spaghetti you don't break. Break the spaghetti. Yeah, Ando, basically. Yeah, those plates, those plates move around, Mab. There's, uh, so, there's the North Atlantic plate, which, that line goes, like, this way, and then it goes over here. You can, you can see the ridge, right there. And then, there's, the crazy part is that there's dormant plates, too. So, these geologically active regions, so like here, and look look where those ridges are, you see that? There's one, Japan, Japan's right on a fault line, so they get a lot of earthquakes and unfortunately tsunamis as well. See all this stuff right there? There's another fault line that goes here. Uh, the, basically what happens is, is like two plates come near each other and depending on what they do when they touch each other, it, it's really kind of dependent on the geologically active region, right? Some plates just do this. They just, one goes underneath the other, that plate gets deposited down into the mantle, it, and then it melts and just goes into the big beef stew that is Earth. You go down there a good ways, below the crust, it's just a big cocktail of like iron and metal and nickel and a bunch of other things. Oh, they touch Martin! Yeah, right? Uh, some plates butt up against each other, like this, and then they go up. When they hit each other, they do stuff like this. So, I, I can show you a pretty good example of that going on, right there. There's a plate right here, and so the entirety of the Indian Peninsula right here was actually, believe it or not, like a couple million years ago, was attached over here, and then it moved up and crashed into Asia. And that's what made the Himalayas. It's pretty cool, right? And it's still crashing into it. Believe it or not, we're watching the world's slowest train train, uh, train derailment right there. You could literally see the ridge of the plate. So India crashed into Southeast or South Asia and went like this. Right? You guys want another crazy one? So check this out. South America, the entire continent. Now I showed you there's, there's like a little sub plate right here, right? 
South America, the entirety of South America, is a plate that is moving that way. And that plate is butting up against the Pacific plate right here, right? It's butting up against the Pacific plate. And believe it or not, what's going on when this happens is South America's moving this way. And it's like if you pushed a tablecloth across the table, like it's going like this. And South America, this is the South American plate. It's actually going up. And that kind of bunched up tablecloth, so to speak, is the Andes. That's what the Andes Mountains are. Right there, some of the hot, some of the tallest mountains in the world, you know, aside from the Himalayas, right? See that? The entirety of the South American continent is moving that way, and it's it's crashing into the Pacific Plate, and it's getting scrunched up as it moves. Hey, exit! What's going on? Yeah, this this I forget what this plate is called. There's a little small plate right there. I forget what it's called. Yeah, Italy is on a separate plate than the rest of Europe. Italy was down here. It was part of Africa, and then the, it, Europe and Africa were once together, and then they split, and then Italy kind of got stuck in the toilet bowl. You know what I'm saying? And it eventually crashed up in, in here, and that's what made the, um, the Alps and the Pyrenees and stuff. Well, well, not Pyrenees. Pyrenees are over here, aren't they? Alps. 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 Yeah, that sounds right, Christian. Not too much, my dude. Just looking at the job market, I see you dropping knowledge bombs as per usual. It's what I do, exit. Yeah, it, guys, don't get me wrong. I ain't no geologist. I know the basics. Rocketry is my thing. It's the Caribbean plate, the Alps, and the Dolomite. It's Dolomite, baby! I don't know, Lithuanian, maybe. Show them the mid Atlantic Bridge. Yeah. See last. Not to mention that South America and Afri Africa fit together like a puzzle. Yep. So, it's actually super interesting stuff because, uh... They find... You find fossilized species, like over here on the Ivory Coast. You find fossilized species here that are species that are native to South America. And then over here, in like the Amazon, you find species that are from like Europe and stuff like it, it's crazy there's all kinds of there's all kinds of nutty stuff going on there's all kinds of evidence everywhere for a supercontinent at one point uh it, it's like it's basically how like if you look at like the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and then you look at like the U.K. which were basically once connected literally you can see Ireland was basically right there I mean more, more or less right the 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 plants are very similar it looks, it looks similar, even though they're 3,000 miles away. What brought up this topic? Uh, uh, a viewer pointed out this thing right there. See that? It's two plates. The East Coasters have stuck with these old worn down tiny mountains. Yeah, the Appalachians are super, super old, Orion. They're super old. Yeah, the Appalachian Mountains, so the mountain range that goes from like here down to there, really, 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 really old. I, I forget how they formed. I, I know somebody knows this, but I, I forget. Yep, that's right, MP Stacks. Yeah, yep. I it's a giant jello mold. It's just a big, just a big jello mold. The discovery of plate tectonics is actually very recent. Yep, yep. You know what's crazy to me? It, you know, to tie this all back into space, Ando, we're the only planet in the solar system that has that. No other planet has plate tectonics. Crazy, right? So how do how do mountains form on Mars then? Even though it has no plate tectonics, right? That's a really interesting question. There's a lot of people trying to figure that one out right now. That's actually what uh, NASA Insight. That's what the Insight lander. You know, they shut it off, I think. I think it's dead. But that's what the InSight lander is trying to figure out. They put a seismograph down on the surface of Mars to try and understand how Mar how did Mars make mountains if it has no plate tectonics. You need plate tectonics to make mountains. Volcanoes and meteor impacts. Well, if there's volcanoes... I mean, I know volcanoes isn't doesn't necessarily... 
is not necessarily evidence for plate tectonics, but volcanoes could do that, yeah. Formed during the first Pangaea collision, parts of the Appalachian chain is in the Scandinavian fjords. That's crazy, God. The seismograph portion of Insight is alive. The digging probe is the part that died. Yep, yep. Astrobiologists are also consider plate tectonics a necessity, necessity for life, or at least a strong condition. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I mean, even volcanoes. How can Mars have... How could... Mars had volcanoes on it, so it's pretty clear that it had volcanoes. Maybe not plate tectonics, but it had volcanoes on it. How did that... Okay, how does it do that if it's not... If the core isn't active, how does that work? Because, like, how I like to describe this to me, and, you know, geologists, you correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody knows a little bit more about this than me. So, like, if Mars is basically an Earth with the power switch off, how did that happen? You know, it was active. Yeah, what, what flipped the switch off? Somebody jiggled the handle on Mars too much. Yeah, Olympus Mons is the biggest mountain in the entire solar system on Mars. That's weird. Yeah, Mars literally blew a fuse. It was Protoss, now that I'd believe. It just cooled off sooner because it's a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah, right? right. Yeah, maybe they forgot to pay the bill. Drummer! Lost its atmosphere, stopped retaining heat. Heat, exported, heat export cooled the core, yeah. Very interesting stuff. That was me, I forgot to put a penny in the meter. Damn it, Breck! You keep pronouncing awesome wrong. Yeah, right? It's really cool stuff, man. Plate tectonics is wild. Yeah, you, you need that for life to exist. Also, plate tectonics produces another thing that we really like. Um, oil. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of compression forces at work with plate tectonics. Yeah, it's a really, really good way to make that. Yeah, compressing carbon at extremely high pressure. Yeah, 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 it makes those. Yeah, pretty good. Not off, just the dimmer is all the way down. Yeah, right? Oh, interesting, Bandit. Yeah. Also, it's like ocean water that... En it's, the, it's like ocean water that enables plate sliding under another. So Venus, being the same size, has no plate tectonics because it has no water and it cannot recycle CO2. Same thing may happen to Earth. You said... You stop plate tectonics, you stop the carbon cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting stuff, man. Got it. Dude, that's like... Ander, we have to figure that one out. We should go to Mars literally for that reason, to figure out what the heck's going on. I, I, Venus might be a little bit better to learn that, learn and understand that, but also at the same time, I don't want to go to Venus. I don't think you want to go to Venus either. That's why the Earth survived, because the water keeps the core cool. It's... Oil, who said anything about oil? Chat, you cooking? Yeah, we should go to Mars, like, strictly for that reason. So we can, like, hopefully figure out a way to not have the dimmer switch go down on Earth either. That would be bad. <sighs> you know, crossing the streams. Egon, you said crossing the streams was bad. Oh, yeah, Blue? Yeah, there you go. I promise, dude, I don't think the material science exists. It's, like, 250 degrees Fahrenheit at, like, like 20 bar pressure or something ridiculous on the surface of Venus, and it rains acid? Like, I'm not like, oh, acid rain. No, no, it, it, it like, yeah, no, it rains, like, what is it, nitric acid or something? I don't even, I don't know, I forget. Yeah, well, the Soviets made Venera work, and oh, Venera was kind of cool. See last paragraph, there's a lot of those. I didn't say it'd be easy to make the suit. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, 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 hey, but I don't, I don't want that. Surface is hot enough to melt lead. See last paragraph, oh. Also, the excess carbon from animals and plants dying into the plate makes the plate more slippery. When it dives down and gets molted, theoretically our mountains are taller because life exists here. Yeah. 
It's wild stuff, dude. So they're working on mechanical electronics. Yeah, yeah. Mechanical computers are cool, man. Analog, baby. Venera worked for 23, 24 minutes. Yeah, and oh uh, yeah, it's like you were saying, that carbon cycle is kind of important, don't you think? We need an optamium. It gets stronger with more pressure. Uh, disregard unobtainium. unobtainium uh, acquire vibranium. I'll take vibranium, thank you very much. Or adamantium. Yeah, I'll take that too. More vibranium than anything else. Yeah, and Grim, yeah, we could, but dude, I don't think we're at necessarily at a at a technological scale where we could go start screwing around with planets' climate. I mean, we're having trouble with this one, the one that we live on right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, someday, though, yeah, that would be cool. We should do that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Not. Yeah, we're not there yet, but I don't, dude, don't doubt humanity. We'll, we could figure out a way to do that. I'm sure we could figure out a way to do that, you know? It's believed Venus had oceans and tectonics, but when the oceans eventually dried up, the tectonic plates seized up, so there was no movement and pressure built up for millions of years until relatively recently when it all broke loose all at once in a planet-wide earthquake. It was basically like millions of volcanoes going off at once, and that's where all the sulfuric acid in the atmosphere came from. Oh, so Venus literally did the engine equivalent of throwing a rod. Like if you run a car engine on no oil, yeah, that's based. Okay, sweet. Yeah, all right. The motor seized. Got it. Yeah, the motor seized. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's um, let's make sure that we don't do that. Basically, plate tectonics release the energy slowly. Oh uh, yeah, so we're in a not weird. We have a nice control burn going on here. Venus has a hole in the block. I don't, I don't think, Mab, I don't, you know what? Visiting Rodney isn't the right way to say that. I, it literally seized. The motor seized. It didn't, it didn't visit Rodney, but the motor seized. You know, Mab, now, now me and the mad scientist, Elon, gotta rip apart the block and replace the tectonic rings you fried. Oh! <laughs> anyway. Is that fun? Sorry. That explains why Venus is suspiciously smooth and lacking in impact craters. Yep, yep. You almost had me? You never had me! You never had your atmosphere! Oh! <laughs> me and the mad geologist! <laughs> it's hypothesized that Venus' surface gets volcanically remodeled every 200 billion years in fire. Yeah. Yeah, and oh, yeah, that's what I mean about not wanting to go there. We, I mean, Rocket Lab can go. Peter Beck wants to go there, but we don't. We don't need to do that. We don't need to go there. I don't. I don't want to go there. How much ring gap do you need on those? Yeah, you got filed down the ring gap a little bit, Mab. They didn't file down the ring gap on that planet. <laughs> I don't think Mars leaned out. Mars went too fuel rich. Venus leaned out. You can have any ocean you want. As long as it's Corona. Wait, what? The thick atmosphere is a recent phenomenon. The Mariner probes revealed that the surface looks like it's entirely recent flat lava floors. Yeah, we should make sure that that doesn't happen here. But I don't. I don't think it will. I think. I don't think it will because we're here. But also, but, 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 yeah, let's not. Let's not do that. 
Let's make sure, make sure that those plate tectonics just keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah, Hibbit. You can go there as long as you don't land. Yeah, I know about, I know about the, the dirigibles. We literally, we literally need this. We literally need that around Venus. Funny story in this, you know, let's ner we want to nerd out for a second. Bespin is a gas mining operation. The planet below them is a gas giant and they're mining the gas giant for, what is it? I was about to say Vespine gas, but no, Tabana gas is what it's called for the Star Wars fans. That's why Bespin exists, because it's a it's a mining operation. Tabana gas, yes. Bespin gas is uh StarCraft. Yeah, StarCraft. Nerd. So you require more Vespin gas. Additional supply depots required. Yeah, of oh, course I think. Mars hydrolocked. <laughs> I'm telling you, car analogies, man. NASA, even NASA, John Honeycutt had car analogies in the NASA press conference the other day. Everything can be attributed to a car. A car is representative of the, the human condition. I'm not crazy, I swear. You must construct additional pylons. Your forces are under attack. Battle cruiser operational. We should be getting up on, uh, getting up here on a mission update. They're gonna as soon as it gets into the tracking station. Yeah, Aquilux. Yeah, we probably don't want to do that. I'll 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 try my luck on Mars, dude. Yeah, I'll try I'll try my luck on Mars. Carrier has arrived. <laughs> Ready for waiting launch orders. When SC2 stream, thrilled I suck at StarCraft. I'm terrible at it. Even though I really enjoy it, I'm really bad. I always tried to one I always tried to 111 BC rush people. And you have one issue left. Most people don't understand how cars work. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, exit. I always tried to one 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 BC rush people, and that got me to gold league. And then, yeah, it didn't get me much further than that. People would get really mad when I did that, though. If it if it worked, if they killed the battle cruiser, then that was the end. That was the end of that. But one 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 BC rushing against Zerg. Oh man, I pissed off so many people. People got so mad at me because they're like, dude, what are you doing? Come on, play me. I'm like, nah, PC. PC, enjoy the Yamato cannon on your hive. Bye-bye. So like, come on, man, I'm trying to practice. I'm like, yeah, practice against this. Battle Cruiser Operational. Yeah, Mass Marine will get you top diamond, yeah. I would, yeah, Aqualex, I would basically castle just... Missile turret bunkers with marines around the base. One factory, one airfield, and then go. Play me from Zerg rushers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is there a BC in my base at seven minutes? Yep. <laughs> yep. That's what I would do. People get so... Zerg especially. They have no early game air defense. Protoss, you can get away with it. Like, Protoss, you gotta be careful. But against Zerg, oh man, they wouldn't be able to get Mutas in time. It's so funny. People get so mad. But I would often lose because they would realize that I was BC rushing and then they would Zerg rush me. Or they would just send two or three Z-Lots in and that's the end of that. Yup! Yeah. And if we somehow got to late game, and I didn't fast and I fast expanded. I would just mass battle cruisers. Not much can take down Tech Three battle cruisers. Nah. nah, you get all the upgrades and everything, 
and you just put siege tanks and marines right at the right at the head of your base and then surround it with missile turrets. I mean, they, they'll find a way through eventually. Eventually you're going to lose because they'll just keep expanding. But if you just hit all their production with battle cruisers, provided they don't see you, oh, it works great. <laughs> you have to get to extreme late game to do that, and if you go too late, then they'll just kill you. StarCraft RP. We should be getting a confirmation on stage burn here. Yeah. No, Dukas, not really. I didn't play past Wings of Liberty, dude. I played, I got Kerbal. Yeah, I, guys, I, that's what I originally wanted to do. I wanted to stream StarCraft. That's why I made an account on Twitch. And then I realized that I was extremely bad at it. Yeah, because I I just wanted to 111 BC rush everybody. Turns out you don't learn very much doing that, but I'm certain you took my ladder points. Yeah, probably, Snib. Yeah, and then I stopped after like maybe a week and a half of doing that. That was in like the summer of 2012. No love here for Tiberium. Yeah, exit. I was at uh, MLG Providence, dude. MLG Providence 2011, dude. I was there, sitting, sitting like the fourth row. I saw. I watched Lenok win. I watched him beat Naniwa and stuff, and MC. Like he wiped the floor with him. He was microwing Zerglings to kill Marines in the early game. It was wild stuff, dude. Yeah, I was there, dude. If you go look at the MLG 2011 pictures, look for a guy in the fifth row, fifth or sixth row with a Bruins jersey on. That's the Bruins jersey, dude. That's in my stream. Yeah, I couldn't believe it, dude. He, he like a Marine would come forward and he'd, he'd have four Zerglings and he'd make one, he put one north, south, east, and west and it would just obliterate the Marine. He couldn't do anything. He was That wasn't against Naniwa. I forget who he was playing. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I meant, I meant Flash. I meant Huck. Idra. In control. Shook that dude's hand. Yeah. Machine. Who else did I? Who else? OGS MC. When he was playing for OGS. So I'm MC. ERG. Lenok. I met all those guys. They don't, they don't know me. I shook their hand. That's right. Rip, dude. Welcome back oh, to the webcast we of Rocket Lab's 30th Electron mission, the OWL spreads its wings. If you're just joining us, today's yeah, launch included good, a dude. successful on-time liftoff at 0838 so New Zealand that, local that, that time or 2038 me. UTC. The Curie engine on the kickstage is completing the burn to circularize its orbit with Synspective Strix-1 satellite on board. Once this maneuver is complete, I we can deploy him. the satellite to its new home He's in there, space. Man. Clear from the camera yet? Okay, here we got an animation. Oh yeah, guitar for sure. Yeah, TV. He was comment. I think he was commentating at. Uh, he was commentating at. Uh, yeah, there we go. There it goes. Problems. Inspector's Strix One satellite has been successfully deployed. Welcome to space once again, Inspective. Congratulations and thank you for flying with us. Excellent. To those watching at home, thanks for joining us for this landmark electron mission as we flew our 30th electron, 300th Rutherford engine, and 150th satellite to space. We're excited to share more of these milestones and successes with you, so stay in the loop by following our social media accounts on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You can find more information about our end-to-end -end global space systems company, including careers, internships, education programs, and of course, our completed missions by going to rocketlabusa.com. Thank you so much at home or wherever in the galaxy you are for joining us today. This is Mission Control, signing off. Galaxy. Cool, successful mission for those guys. Maybe somebody actually is on Venus. Anyway.
they know something. That's right. Yeah, tons of FC guys are still, uh, StarCraft 2 guys are still around. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Dude, I meant Tastosis. That was, that was fun. Those guys are cool. Really cool dudes. Where will the second stage end up, end up roaming around? It, it's gonna, the second stage deployed Photon. Well, it's in a decaying orbit. It'll burn up. Since you played Hearts of Iron 4, is there a reason why you don't try Stellaris? Not enough time, honestly, Tomas. Not enough time. Not enough time, dude. Day 9 was is the best. Yeah, for real. Day 9 is kind of where I picked up teaching, like, using games to teach people. I just... Basically, I started just doing what Day 9 did, but with Kerbal. Straight up. Yeah. I could have done it better. Day 9 was... The, the, the Day 9 daily back in the day... Very good time, dude. Yeah, Snib. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, League of Legends killed the StarCraft community, and I still hate League of Legends for that exact reason. Yeah, Snib, for sure. Yeah, that's a long time ago, man. December needs to come soon for the Wallops launch. Yeah, I'm with you. all killed our all rts games yeah i i hate league of legends map for that reason i'm sorry i'm not trying to be a dick if you like league of legends that's fine it's just really annoying that it killed the sc2 community jsdn how are you valix ciao how's it going it's going good man how are you get moving into that new place yep 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 Lol, it's such a warm, welcoming community. Yeah, I know, it's a model for for uh, low toxicity. Anyway, so the Electron mission was good. Uh, up there with Counter-Strike. Oh, Counter-Strike's my neck of the woods, man. Counter-Strike. I love that game, dude. I can't play it, though. I shouldn't play, I shouldn't play it on stream, dude. It's Dude, that game is so much harder when you're streaming it. When you're not streaming it, you can sit there and you can really think about what you're doing. It's hard to do that as a streamer. It's hard for me to check out and just forget that chat's there because I talk to you guys a lot. You're in Golden Over playing with LEM. Hmm. One board cube in Starbase. I don't know, Jeff. I don't know, Jeff, has it? Anyway. Who would you say was my favorite SC2 player? Ooh. Taking me back, dude. Yeah, Dan, I know what you mean. I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm trying to remember, dude. I, I I like the Terran players, but I'm trying to forget. Who was a hot Terran player at that time? Like, who was really good at it? I forget. White Raw was a cool dude. Yeah, that guy was cool. Boxer, Boxer was insane. Insane, serious. Yeah. MVP, yeah. Mm. MKP. I'm trying to remember. Here, hold on. Let me let me take a look.
I think, yeah, Marine King, yeah. Yeah, he was up there, but that doesn't... Marine King Prime, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, it's coming back to me. It's all coming back to me. It's been so long, dude. It's been over 10 years. Yeah, dude, I remember it. Dude, I, I remember I, at that at MLG Providence 2011, I uh I had a really long chat with Sundance Di Giovanni about like esports and stuff and we and in baseball too. Yeah. If you really want to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I was talking to him. Dude, I saw I saw him standing on the stage before it all before everything started and I freaking Yeah. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's a really good dude. Here, let me let me switch this over to Space News. I'm trying to what I have is this uh Yeah, here I have this picture up from MLG Providence dudes. So Check this out. That's the left. That was the left thing. And then if you look all the way over here, see the yellow? Actually, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's me. I was down, I was down a little ways. Look around for a Bruins jersey. I know I was I wasn't sitting that far from in control. He's right there. Him and Anna were right. They were like really, really close. He's over here somewhere. I think I was sitting next to that dude. But it was me and uh me and a couple other people. That was a long time ago, man. Yeah, interesting. Let me look at let me look at the brackets. Hold on. Yeah, TB wasn't TB wasn't at that one. Artosis was there. Clutch was there. Husky and JP were there. Bitter was there. Tasteless and DJ Weed. Yeah, that was dude. That was a good show. It was a good tournament. Yeah, Leenock won. Yeah, he beat Nanny. Well, I remember that. Yeah, boxer. That guy's nuts, dude. He was nuts back in the day. Yeah. Drewby was a good player back in the day. I don't even know. Dude, I don't even know if these guys still play. Yeah, look at this. Look at this lineup, though. Huck, Idra, Naniwa was there. MC was there. MC was nuts, dude. I and mean, he still is. These guys, most of these guys are still around. Destiny was there, too. Yeah, I watched him play. Yeah, that Destiny. Yeah, I know. TLO, that guy was cool. Machine, yeah, machine's a good. Any F1 tonight? I don't know. I got to stop in a couple of hours here. Any strategies that tilted you cannon rushing? Oh, dude, I don't even remember what the strats were. All I remember is, all I remember is Lenok beating. Dude, no, he. He wasn't beating Marines. He was beating. He was beating freaking uh, Zealots. He was beating Zealots with Zerglings. I remember that in the final. It was unbelievable. No way, right in front. Yep. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, uh, ha -ha. That's pre-stream. Pre-stream, EJ. 
Whoa. That's me and Dr. Maple, believe it or not. And then, so Dr. Maple's one of my moderators, dude. Unbelievable. Yeah, I had my flyers on, dude. I still have those shoes. Wow. Thomas, where the hell did you find this? Yeah, dude, I was sitting, we were sitting in the center. In the center, fifth row back, me, me and Maple. Yeah. You don't look that different, you just have more hair. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's me on my Samsung Galaxy S1. And then we, yeah, they were giving out free Dr. Pepper. Dude, the boards. I still have that. We printed out the MLG Providence or the MLG logo, and I got a bunch of famous StarCraft streamers to sign it. That's what I mean when I say it shook all their hands. I still have it. I don't know if Maple has his, but... Dude, Thomas, I straight up don't remember this. I don't remember why. I don't remember how we got out in front. But yep, that, yep, there it is. Me, I'm like, who? Why is my picture being taken? I don't understand. Holy crap! Yeah, see, see, there's the pictures to prove it. I tell you, man, I was there. Yeah. What the hell happened to you? You used to be handsome? What? 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 What the hell, man? What do, you, what do you mean? What do you want me to do? Don't look that different. Yeah, chat happened. Yeah, that's what happened, Panta. Chat happened. How old would I have been in that picture? Twenty eleven. I was twenty-three. Twenty-three. I like my hair. I like this one, man. It's easy. Easy, you don't have to take care of it. That's twenty-three. That's pre-stream. That's pre pre-stream. Yep. Yeah. You're that young? I'm that young in these pictures. I'm 23, I think. No, of course, no. Yeah. That's very weird. Man. Dude, yeah, definitely, definitely had more hair. Definitely, definitely had more hair. Yeah. Yeah, I've never really been able to see it. Yeah, no, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, definitely, yeah, yep, yeah, okay. Yeah, definitely had more hair. Hmm. You look like the most stereotypical dude bro football player. Yeah, yeah, people, a lot of people got really confused with, by the Bruins shirt. Yeah. 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 That's weird, man. Yeah, the hair just kind of migrated from here to down here. So how long ago was this picture? This was 11 years ago? Ugh. Yeah, my hair just migrated. Just kind of went from this area down to this area right here. Man. It's weird, dude. Thomas, are there any other of those pictures? Honestly? Are there any more pictures? Glad you got better from being a Bruins fan. You're better off now. It's off. Hair tectonics. Yes.
weird, man. Yeah, we. I remember we were at the front of the gate because uh, we got there like a, way early so we could get a good seat. Oh man, that's strange. That was a long time ago, man. Yeah, we, we were like fifth row because the seats in front of us were reserved for players and stuff. Man, that's weird, dude. That's weird. Yeah, Cozy, I don't really remember much. I remember what even what I was doing. Oh, that's cool, W. Neat. Huh. What? No house? No kids? I still don't have any kids. Soon. No, that's not confirming anything. Relax. Is it normal to feel a limitless sense of power driving around a rover? Oh. Ah, uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, that didn't work. Are you for Granonant? Can you get Pergert? Now I'm just looking into pictures. I'm trying to look at all the pictures of the crowds. Yeah, I was sitting, like, over here somewhere. I still have that MLG shirt, by the way. I packed it up when we moved. Huh. Yeah, you saw him, Ducas, right? I shook his hand that day. Yeah. He was sitting right next to me. I went over and talked to him. Very brief, very brief. I just said, hi, I like what you do. You're a cool dude. Yeah, no, I, I remember. I remember I was like, no, nah, in control is cool because, you know, he focuses on personal health. He's a big dude. You know, like I was just, I'm just, dude, I was just as tall as him. So I was like, that's awesome. I love what I said. Like, I love what you're doing with, uh, with like working out and streaming. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And he said, yeah, he said, thank you. He's a really nice guy. It, it, dude, it, dude, I'll tell you, man, it bummed me out. That bummed me out when he passed. That really, that really bothered me a lot. It still kind of does. It's just, uh, yeah, that was a terrible day, you know. This <laughs> is, yeah, sidebar crazy. I stopped doing for years. It was really sudden. It sucks, dude. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, he's a good dude. I was I was autographed. Yeah, autographed him a long time ago. Anyway, you still use this VO and SC two? Good man. Good man. Yeah, Dukas, he, yeah, clotted up, and that was the end of that. Shame. Anyway, guys, uh, we got about two hours left of streaming. What do you want to do? I don't think two hours is enough to get an F1 race in. We could just do Space News for the rest of the night. I just got to take a quick break. Oh, that's cool, Hellfish. Oh, you found one. Look what showed up today. Yeah, you found one. Nice. You want to get me one of those and then the transmission that goes with it? 
Bridge, 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 bridge. Wow. Space cities bridge talk. Okay. Uh. Uh, give me one, give me one second. We'll uh, let me let me put on a video. I'm gonna take take a quick second here. Break will be shorter than usual because it's a short stream today. How's the Falcon launch tonight going to work for the stream? It's not. I have to pick up Remo's parents at the airport. Awesome. That's um, not that would be something that we don't want to uh, miss. But hopefully it scrubs again. But even if it goes tomorrow, I probably still can't cover it. Uh, I'm trying to find something. There might be racing, maybe, if I'm back in time. Next two days are going to get pretty crazy for you, boy. It's Oh, of course, it's my sister's wedding. I got it. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm in the, the wedding party. That's, that's going to be fun. Yeah, I mean, even with all the, all the Starlink launches, Sniper, I've only missed four Falcon 9 launches ever. Like, ever. Yeah. <laughs> ever. Which is pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Hellfish, no, I won't. Ah, it's already gone by, Hibbit. Remember how I said there was wedding stuff that I, the reason why I couldn't go down to SLS? Well, one, that was another wedding, and two, that as well. Two of my favorite streamers have their sister's wedding in the same week. Okay. I'm trying to find a, uh, I'm trying to find something to watch that has to do with cities. Modern Marvels? I can't watch Modern Marvels. It's not public resource. Of course. Here. Let's try it. Here, hold on. Maybe the Smithsonian Channel will have something. I don't actually know if the Smithsonian Channel is public resource. I don't think it is. It's okay. We have mountain climber mode now. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I don't think it is. Let's try this one. Look for stuff on the interstate system. We just got to find stuff that's, uh, got to find stuff that's public, uh, public domain, dude. With the NASA stuff, it's always easy to find it because NASA stuff is all public domain and it's everywhere. What are you looking for? Uh, I don't know. 
I might just put on one of the usual things that we watch. Uh, what do we watch? We watched Ascent yesterday. Uh, I don't know, Sirius. I'll just put on the Orbital Mechanics one. That's my go-to. I'll be okay. So I'll be back in a little bit, fellas. Ooh, drummer. That's a good one. You know what? I changed my mind. Change my mind. That's a better one. Flashing through the sky struck man with a deep sense of wonder. Even today, man's reaction to a meteoric display is likely to jam the switchboards with reports of imminent invasion from space. But as heirs to the knowledge, disciplines, and apparatus of the scientific revolution, we are familiar with, and at least partially understand, the meteoric phenomena. A meteoroid traveling in space outside our atmosphere remains unseen by man, for the molecules in space are so dispersed that collision with them causes no visible effect. If its trajectory traverses the Earth's atmosphere, it becomes a meteor. Here it begins to collide with more molecules. These collisions become more and more frequent as the meteor descends into the denser air of lower altitudes, causing it to decelerate. Each collision converts some of the energy of motion into heat energy, and the heat continues to increase until the meteor itself becomes incandescent, scribing its visible path through the night sky. Destroyed in the atmosphere by this heating, most meteors present no danger to man. Now and then, one is large enough to survive its passage through the atmosphere to Earth. It is then called a meteorite, and some are very large indeed. Dr. Peter Parameter became interested in meteors early in his career, and once wrote a paper titled, A Thermokinetic Description of Bodies and Passage Through a Plastic Medium of Nonlinear Density at Random Velocities and Angles, which could be just about summed up with this equation. With this equation, his fellow scientists and designers are able to explain the effects of atmospheric penetration on differing bodies, those with different ballistic coefficients, at various velocities and angles. For example, if two bodies of different weights enter the Earth's atmosphere with the same velocity and entry angle, both the heavy body and the light one will begin to heat up at the same time. But impacts of air molecules slow the light body sooner. This deceleration of the light body occurs at higher altitudes, while the heavier, more energetic body penetrates deeper before it reaches peak deceleration. The total amount of heat generated by the lighter one is less than that generated by the heavy one, whose larger mass gives it greater kinetic energy. Two identical bodies with the same velocity entering the atmosphere at different angles also will decelerate at different rates. The steeper angle causes a more rapid encounter with the dense air, resulting in more abrupt deceleration. The total heat generated will be the same for both bodies, but peak heating will be less for the shallow entry. With identical meteors entering at the same angle but with different velocities, the faster meteor, under heavier bombardment by air molecules, 
will have greater deceleration, generating more heat and at a higher rate. But Dr. Parameter is no longer merely an observer interested in understanding the phenomena of meteors. A meteor is just an aimless traveler in space. Doc finds himself now involved in designs with a purpose and an aim. A missile has a target, and a spacecraft has a destination, a journey's end. To these, Doc applies his knowledge. He knows natural phenomena, both of aimless meteor and aimed missile. He knows that as they traverse the atmosphere, they heat up. If the heating or deceleration of a vehicle is excessive, the mission is threatened. Man cannot change the laws of nature, so he must use his knowledge to work within those laws. Doc Parameter knows that the two natural enemies to successful atmospheric penetration are deceleration and heat. He can fight these enemies on two possible fronts. First, on the design front, by modifying the vehicle's shape and size relative to its weight. In other words, its ballistic coefficient. And second, on the program front, by altering the vehicle's trajectory, its velocity, its attitude, and its angle of entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Parameter is now ready to use his technology to plan a successful re-entry for an ICBM warhead. He knows that of the two natural enemies, deceleration and heat, high deceleration is not a problem with a warhead. But too much heat could destroy it. He first surveys the project on the program front. He knows that the re-entry velocities and angles are essentially set by the mission. But to reduce heat load, the velocity of the re-entry vehicle could theoretically be reduced by firing a retro rocket. On investigation, he finds that in order to decrease re-entry velocity sufficiently by this method, a retro thrust system would be required weighing many times the weight of the warhead. This method is out. He next considers the possibility of changing the re-entry angle. He knows that a shallow angle will lessen the peak heat load by stretching the heating over a longer period of time. But the total heat generated will be the same either way, and the vehicle could absorb even more heat during this longer re-entry. Furthermore, a shallow re-entry angle has other serious drawbacks. First, a shallow angle impairs accuracy by deflection in the atmosphere. Second, it affords more time for enemy interception. A steep re-entry improves the missile's chances of avoiding interception and of reaching its target with minimum atmospheric deflection. In this case, altering the program is not the answer to the heat problem. Dr. Parameter must attack the problem of heat on the design front. Logic would seem to indicate that fast travel requires a streamlined shape to slice its way through the air. At subsonic velocities, this is true. But at supersonic speeds, the moving vehicle displaces air molecules which bounce off, forming a shock wave. As speed increases, the shock wave becomes more severe, and heating increases. An ICBM will have a free-fall re-entry speed in excess of 23,000 feet per second. At this speed, the heat of molecular collision and friction, shearing of air molecules, is concentrated in a narrow zone along the surface of a streamlined vehicle. The heat generated may cause the temperature to exceed 15,000 degrees Fahrenheit. To combat this terrific heat, Dr. Parameter designs instead a re-entry vehicle with a blunt frontal area. The blunt shape creates its shock wave somewhat ahead of the vehicle. This occurs because the atmospheric molecules colliding with its frontal surface bounce back and intercept others coming in, setting up a kind of picket line in advance of the warhead. The peak heat is generated in this area away from the surface of the vehicle. Although the blunt shape decreases the peak heating of the warhead to half that of the streamlined shape, it will still heat up to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, much too hot for unprotected warhead structures. 
To further reduce heating, Dr. Parameter must find other techniques in addition to the blunt shape. His first solution is the heat sink. Use the blunt design and add a mass of heat conducting metal large enough to absorb most of the heat generated during re-entry without melting before impact. It works, but he is not yet satisfied. The weight of the heat sink displaces more than one-fourth of the payload. Furthermore, the blunt design slows the missile, keeping it in the atmosphere a longer time, making it less accurate and easier to intercept. For the greatest accuracy and shortest time in the atmosphere, Doc knows that the streamlined shape is the best. But the heat sink cannot absorb and distribute the sudden extreme heat generated during the re-entry of a streamlined vehicle. Doc reasons, if the heat cannot be absorbed, why not eject it as fast as it's generated? The answer is ablation. Ablation! Coat the frontal surface of the streamlined missile with layers of ablative material composed of fibers, resins, and ceramics. This ablative coating protects the missile from the extreme heat in several ways. It is a poor heat conductor. Its surface gradually melts away, taking heat with it, and its vapor forms a thin insulating layer, deflecting some of the heat from the surface. The ablative principle combats the heat problem effectively and permits steeper re-entry angles while adding a minimum of weight. The streamlined missile, with its increased speed, affords the least possibility of interception and the greatest accuracy. It does produce a huge deceleration factor approaching 150 Gs. Fortunately, this poses no threat to a warhead. But for manned or other recovery missions, the G-load is a most important factor. For manned re-entry, this force should be held below 10 Gs. A shallow re-entry angle of about 1 to 5 degrees is the simple answer. The shallower the angle, the less the G-load. But this will be sustained over a longer period of time. This means a longer time at high speed through the friction of the atmosphere. Let's take a moment to see why this is not desirable. Dr. Parameter? Thank you. A gentleman, we have here a kettle of water. Heathcliff, we can use you in this experiment. Oh boy, an experiment. Thank you, sir. Now, if we may have another kettle of water and your stand-in. Thank you. Now we'll proceed with the experiment. Experiment? We'll add the same amount of fuel under each kettle, but alter the form of the fuel under one kettle to make it burn faster. We ignite both at the same time. and compare the results. Splendid. And I'd like to point out that the fast-burning fuel, although reaching its intensity quickly, exhausted itself quickly. The heat absorbed was negligible. The slow-burning fuel, on the other hand, gradually increases in intensity. It will generate the same total heat load, but over a longer period of time. And you'll notice more heat is absorbed. Wow! Thank you, Heathcliff. Thank you, Dr. Parameter. So although the peak heat generated in the shallow re-entry is less, the capsule is in the heating regime for a longer time and without the utmost protection would absorb an intolerable amount of heat. For manned re-entry, Dr. Parameter overcomes the deceleration enemy through program with the shallow angle, but he must combat heat on the design front. A blunt shape to cause a detached shockwave a picket line against heat, and ablative materials for additional heat control. The doc is confident his new design will fulfill the requirements. Now to try it out. He wants low peak deceleration, so the shallow re-entry path is mandatory. This brings him down safely, if a little off target. To achieve some control and accuracy as well as safety, Dr. Parameter has been working on other design concepts, particularly shapes that produce lift. He knows that a ballistic missile is designed and programmed to hit a particular point on the Earth's surface. A manned ballistic vehicle with the same objective 
is much less accurate due to its design and long, shallow penetration. But a lifting vehicle, which is capable of descending at a still more shallow angle and with an extremely low deceleration rate, is able to change direction. This control gives it wide selectivity of landing sites within a large footprint area. For the shortest range within the footprint, the vehicle is pulled up into a maximum lift attitude at re-entry. This induces maximum drag, causing a steeper, more abrupt descent. For the longest possible range, the vehicle must assume the attitude of maximum lift over drag ratio. This footprint, huge at first, shrinks gradually as the vehicle descends. Dr. Parameter, while considering the advantages of lifting vehicles, is also aware of their drawbacks. First, the lifting structure itself imposes weight penalties, which compete with the all-important matter of payload. Then, lifting vehicles may also spend up to 20 minutes in the heat regime, and being more streamlined, they require a still more complex heat protection system, competing still further with payload. Dr. Parameter, with his associates, has studied the strategy of atmospheric penetration. He knows its natural enemies, deceleration and heat, and has met them on the two fronts of program and design. He has accomplished important objectives. For the intercontinental ballistic missile, the objectives are rapid atmospheric penetration and accuracy. The warhead's natural enemy is sudden intense heat. Its program, high velocity, steep re-entry. Its design, streamlined with ablation to combat sudden heat. For a manned or other recovery mission, the objectives are, first of all, safety, and then control. The mission's natural enemies, high deceleration, sustained heat. Its program, shallow re-entry for low deceleration. The vehicle's design, blunt, yet with control capabilities, a maneuverable lifting shape. The resulting long duration within the heat regime exacts a weight penalty because a complex heat protection system is needed. There will always be problems to solve. Dr. Parameter has worked out successful compromises so far but he is still puzzling, still exploring. He plots his graphs, his curves, and flings them boldly into space. But he knows that we have barely gotten our little toe into space, and he constantly seeks to improve that toehold. He must hold to the possible, yet he constantly works along its impossible edges.